Hello, I'm Steve Nunn, President and CEO of The Open Group. Welcome to Toolkit Tuesday, where we highlight the various components and leading experts of the Architects Toolkit, a collated portfolio of the most pertinent technology standards for enterprise architects. During the series, I'll be calling on a number of recognized experts who will bring their particular insights on how to most effectively use the various tools in the Architects Toolkit. We'll have a mix of interviews, panel sessions, and pre-recorded presentations along the way. While all standards of the Open Group are designed so they can be adopted independently of one another, the greatest value for an organization can be derived when they're used in unison. The sum of the parts should be greater than the whole. In the Architects Toolkit, we have collated a portfolio of the most pertinent ones for architects together, all in one place. For most of these tools, certification from the Open Group is also available, so practitioners can demonstrate that they have the skills required, and recruiters can take the guesswork out of the recruitment process, all backed up by our Open Badges program. Welcome wherever you are in the world, and thank you for joining us on Toolkit Tuesday. Um, as I always say on these occasions, um, I hope wherever you are in the world, you're safe and well. And obviously, our thoughts and prayers are with the people of Ukraine at this particular time as they uh, continue to endure the, the horrors and uh, tragedies of, of war. Um, our, our thoughts are with them, and uh, I'm sure... Um, we all hope for a speedy resolution to this situation and the uh, uh, just just putting putting behind and getting back for those uh, getting back to normal for those uh, those those poor people. Anyway, um, we can all talk for a long time about that and uh, just uh, know that uh, we at the Open Group are very um, uh, very thoughtful about the situation and that life has to go on, of course. Uh, and we have a broadcast here today, which is um, why you're all here, I hope. And uh, we're going to have a um, slightly different session today at, at Toolkit Tuesday. Just before I introduce that, though, um, we have uh, uh, something very exciting happening soon. Uh, we have our first face to face. Um, quarterly event of the open group for over two years uh, and and uh, very relevant to our audience here for toolkit tuesday it's an architecture practitioners conference so uh, it's being hosted in london it's a hybrid meeting so uh, we will have a mix of people uh, physically present and uh, those joining uh, remotely uh, and hopefully uh, many of you uh, here we you will be uh, either there physically or joining us remotely and uh, it's going to be a great event, and uh, we'll have some uh, uh, some interesting things um, to announce at it. So please join us. So for today, we are looking back at some of the questions that we didn't get to that have uh, arisen on previous uh, previous episodes of Toolkit Tuesday. Um, we don't always get a chance to get through all the questions. In fact, we rarely get through all of them do our best, um, but we have uh, a list of things that are, are hanging over from, from previous um, previous episodes. So please, um, uh, I'll, I'll get, to, get through as many as I can. Um, I can't promise that we will um, get to any uh, new questions live today, but if you have something that's burning and you'd really like to ask um, our panelists today, then uh, please do submit it in the, in the Q&A channel. This is the WebEx tool and the Q&A channel. If you can't see it, if you click on the three dots in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, you'll see uh, Q&A as an option to click. And that's where you should ask any new questions. Uh, please use the chat channel, as people are starting to do, to um, give greetings from wherever you are in the world. Um, it's a very much a glo global audience here, and we're very proud of that. So it's great to see where you're all joining us from. So without further ado, uh, I'm not going to risk uh, not getting through these questions for a second time. So um, we have three panelists joining us, three joining me today, um, who will um, be taking a look at some of these uh, some of these questions. And it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome each of them here. So uh, in no particular order, um, Chris Frost, Principal Enterprise Architect 
uh, global delivery unit at Fujitsu. So Chris has worked for Fujitsu since 2005 in a variety of technical leadership roles. At present, he is principal enterprise architect within the global delivery unit, which provides standard services, technical guidelines and support to the global Fujitsu group. Inside the open group, Chris has led the TOGAF Agile working group since uh, during 2020 and is contributing to a number of current architecture forum activities as well as doing some uh, being uh, co-chair in our, our digital pr practitioner work group. Before Fujitsu, Chris worked for EDS, which is now part of DXC, on several large contracts for the Ministry of Defence in the UK, and in earlier years, he worked for Ford, Shell, and a, sm a small start software startup house called Shamrock Marketing. So welcome, Chris Frost. Um, our second panellist today, a colleague of mine, Dr. Palab Sahar, um, Palab is the general manager of, for um, India within the Open Group, um, as well as uh, chief architect of Southeast Asia and president of the Association of Enterprise Architects for India. Dr. Saha has been identified as a thought leader by IBM Smart City Connect and featured by Forbes magazine. A Mayati NEGD senior lead expert in enterprise architecture and a visiting professor of digital architecture at the Institute uh, Indian Institute of Management, Dr. Saha advises various ministries and states in India on matters pertaining to government-wide architecture initiatives. And uh, the scope of his work expands beyond India too, of course. Welcome, Palab. Great to have you back. Thank and you last but by no means least, um, Peter Maloney, who is Senior Engineering Fellow at Raytheon Company. Uh, Peter's long career path has taken him from developing and applying solid state technologies for radar system applications to his current role as a system architect. He became interested in, in enterprise architectures and particularly service oriented architecture as a result of the ever expanding need for providing access to increasingly complex data products to a diverse group of end users with the resulting needs for collaboration through management and security. Peter is a Raytheon Certified Architect, which is a program accredited by the Open Group, and a three-time winner of the Raytheon Excellence in Technology Award. He holds one patent and has authored more than a dozen papers. Inside the Open Group, Peter is the co-chair of the Microservices Project within the SOA Working Group. So welcome back to you, Peter. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. So everyone's here. Great to have you all. And as you can see, folks, we're uh, we're in good hands here for um, getting our questions answered. Um, I'm going to start with the question that's probably come up the most regularly um, in one form or another um, over the uh, episodes of Talk It Tuesday, and in fact, um, generally inside the Open Group. But I'm going to I'm going to point it to you, Chris Frost, first. Um, because it, it plays right to one of the things you've been working on in the in the open group uh, in the Toga Agile working group, um, and and the question, um, the latest version of the question anyway, is uh, enterprise architecture and agile, are they fundamentally incompatible or can they coexist? Can you kick us off with that one, please? Sure can, Steve. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, well, I mean, the short and simple answer is they are. Uh, absolutely compatible and uh, and must coexist. They they need each other very strongly. Um, whatever approach you're using uh, to build large scale solutions and uh, do all the good things with enterprise architecture about tying that back to your uh, business objectives and helping that develop your business strategy. Um, you need all of those same disciplines of enterprise architecture. Uh, whether you're uh, using an underlying waterfall style of delivery or an agile style delivery or or whatever you're doing. And uh, you can see the evidence of that if you just simply look at many of the well-known um, agile at scale methods. Uh, I won't need to name them here, but um, I'm sure everybody knows and can think of a number of the popular methods for doing agile at scale. And that need for architecture is uh, is explicitly called out in them. Um, and of course, the relationship works the other way as well. Um, if you look at the TOGAF standard, for example, um, it 
it says, of course, that you need to do a certain amount of work and you and you need to plan that and you need to deliver that. But it doesn't say anything at all about the the method of doing so, whether it should be a waterfall approach or an agile approach. So they need each other. You, you need the project framework in order to, to plan and control and manage the work. Uh, and you need the architecture goodness um, so that you set all of those right architectural directions and make sure it's tied back to your enterprise strategy. So they coexist very well and they need each other very strongly. Great stuff. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. And um, we will uh, probably hear more about that soon, I, um, I imagine. Um, it's a question that keeps coming up. Um, it so, is. Uh, yeah. Not the last time you'll, uh, you'll answer it, I'm sure. Um, so I'm going to um, switch now. If I can take a question, um, I mean, I, I, I'll uh, deliberately not ask the other panelists that one because we've got lots to get through. But um, we have a number of questions that arose from your your presentation uh, a while back, Peter, on microservices, mm -hmm. um, and specifically the TOGAF series guide on microservices that uh, microservices architecture that you helped uh, author. So. First question for you, Peter. Um, could you please give an example of a microservices architecture used in an organization? Sure, and I, I think probably the, the classic example is actually Netflix. Um, and it's certainly one that uh, we, we studied as part of our work. Um, their streaming service is based entirely upon cloud-based microservices these days. Uh, they have more than a thousand microservices involved in managing their operations. Uh, originally, they were a monolith and they embarked upon moving to cloud based and microservices uh, back in 2009, I think before the term microservices was even in common use. Uh, and they migrated their entire uh, ecosystem to an, uh, current cloud based in incarnation over a period of about two years. And I think one of the Testaments as to what that got for them was uh, some years back, the entire uh, Amazon Web Services Northeast crashed, and Netflix was not actually aware of that until some hours later when their metrics told them what had happened because they remained up and running without interruption through the whole thing. So that, that shows the power of both agile and, uh, and microservices based architectures. Right, right. That's great. I can see our other. Other folks are nodding on uh, nodding on that one. So, um, um, and while while I have you, Peter, and we're we're on microservices, I'll take another one uh, early in this. Um, one of the things that you you um, referred to when you presented on microservices architecture was um, the concept of distributed business requirements. Could you say a little more about what they are? What do you mean by distributed business requirements? Is the question. Sure, that's a good question. Um, what we really mean is simply that, and, and this I think ties in very well with uh, the idea of domain-driven design, uh, is that each business domain, and you can break this down to a lower level obviously, um, has its own distinct set of requirements that in large part are not really dependent on requirements anywhere else within the business enterprise. They are really specific to that particular domain. Uh, of course, you have to worry about you know intra-business interface requirements and you have to maintain all those in common. But a lot of that activity is carried out within just the business domain, and it really ought to be the concern of only that business team to decide how those requirements should be met. Um, and as I will talk in answer to a different question, distributed governance is really the key concept making this process work, because otherwise you're risking creating you know, a very slow moving monolith where you have just too many stakeholders involved to be able to make decisions quickly and being able to make decisions quickly and implement them is really uh, one of the keys to architecture these days. Great stuff. Okay, well, we'll, we'll cycle back to that. Um, uh, other panelists, if you do have anything to to uh, to, to, to add, then um, then please let me know. But um, otherwise, I'll uh, I'll carry on going through the questions. And uh, I'm going to come to you next, Palab. Um, we had a question that that uh, came in that was. Um, about the use of um, TOGAF um, specifically or enterprise architecture more generally in education. Um, and, you know, are you aware of TOGAF being used in the education field? And I know this is quite timely um, as a question. So uh, uh, can you take that one on for us, please? Uh, 
you know, there are, there are two ways to answer that question. One is uh, whether enterprise architecture broadly and whether TOGAF as a framework is taught within educational programs in, in, in academic settings. So for instance, if it is a course in, in some kind of a graduate or postgraduate level program. So the answer is absolutely yes. There are several universities across the world who do this. And specifically, as you mentioned, this is a very timely question. In India, we are launching the academic initiative with that very intent basically to uh, to introduce enterprise architecture, to introduce architecture thinking at graduate and postgraduate level courses. So this could be, for instance, part of an MBA program or an MS program or Master of Engineering or Master of Technology program. So the launch of that initiative is going to happen this Friday. So this is as timely as, mm -hmm. as you were mentioning. So that's that's one part of the yes. The other part of the yes is do we have enterprise architecture being adopted within the educational institution because even an educational institution is an enterprise, right? So to that, the answer is an absolute yes, because just two weeks back, we launched, we released a new uh, case study, which is basically uh, Spain uh, higher education sector adopting enterprise architecture for its own universities and the entire education ecosystem. So this is basically applying TOGAF within the enterprise of a university or an academic institution. So that's why I said the answer has to be from two perspectives. One is being taught as a subject and other is being university or an enterprise, you know, university being taken as an enterprise and modeled, you know, in terms of from, an, from a TOGAF perspective. So, yeah. I think you make, a, you make an important point, Pala, that, you know, a university or a, an academic institution it is an enterprise. Um, Absolutely. in itself and so there's nothing uh, uh, nothing that uh, means that uh, EA isn't isn't applicable there um, I mean Chris or, or, or Peter I, have you seen any uh, been been involved in any work that's that's aimed at the academic world uh, certainly have Steve uh, yeah a uh, couple of examples that uh, I've personally been involved in to varying degrees. I, I won't name the specific universities because uh, protect the client confidentiality. Um, but certainly uh, one example, a university in the UK where uh, we were designing um, a, a internal solution for them. And uh, of course, we used as part of our standard architecture practice uh, uh, TOGAF to uh, design that solution. And uh, actually, another example in Japan, because of course, uh, Fujitsu, who I work for, a Japanese company, um, working closely with a large university uh, in Japan. Um, I was providing some sort of backup support because uh, I'm afraid my Japanese is nowhere near good enough to be able to actually directly engage with uh, the Japanese customer, but I was supporting some of our architects who were directly involved there, um, where we were helping them collaboratively develop their enterprise architecture using some TOGAF and, and in fact, some uh, Archimate modeling as well. So, uh, yeah, ab absolutely um, using all of this, uh, all of this goodness to help the university define their own internal enterprise architecture. Yeah, that's great. And I, I think it's in a, it's um it's a sector that I think we'll see more and more um, case studies coming out of as we uh, uh, mm -hmm. as it embeds a bit more and there there are more um, courses taught and more more use and more ability to talk about these things you know what worked and what didn't that's uh, that's what everyone wants isn't it of course um, let me um, move um, back to microservices architectures um, you. Uh, stirred a lot of questions when you were when you were presenting last time um peter so um you you touched on this earlier about governance but the specific question that came in which uh, which i think is uh, is a great one it's it's how much freedom should be given to teams to select anything in their technology um you know there's a lot of talk about um giving giving the teams a lot of independence, a, a lot of autonomy here, but how much freedom should be given to teams to select anything? In other words, how much governance is ideal? Yeah, and, and that is a great question. And um, it, it doesn't have an easy answer, right? And, and part of this is relying on the enterprise architects to create a set of enterprise guidelines for those items which really matter to the enterprise, 
while allowing the individual teams to have a free hand in things that don't need standardization at the enterprise level. Uh, so, for example, certainly purchasing decisions and, you know, company-wide agreements, which can provide cost advantages at the enterprise level, might dictate your choice of, you know, particular computing or storage technologies. Um, perhaps the enterprise wants to make sure that all of its users, all its customers, see exactly the same interface, uh, same look and feel as much as possible, and they the create a template for all those application interfaces, and they want to mandate that for all external transactions. And uh, so the important thing is for, you know, those enterprise architects really need to think very clearly about which items are very important at the enterprise level and create appropriate guidelines. Um, and a, a little bit of self-promotion in our first uh, uh, paper for the Open Group on Microservices, which is uh, referred to as W169, uh, we actually provided a, a governance model um, that, that shows that. And again, the, the, the team that owns microservices, it's really about having autonomy between what's in their domain, you know, what their bounded context is. Yeah, okay, well, that's, a, that's a, um, uh, good to mention specifically the, the, uh, the white paper, the document, um, because uh, there's a lot of information uh, on the Open Group website um on this in the uh, in the open group library and you can search by topic um and uh, there's a lot of good stuff there that uh, folks may not be may not be aware of so um thank you for that any other um comments for uh, Palab or chris on um on governance as you've as you've seen it it's a, you know it's a it's a a topic that's uh, very important and comes and goes and uh, any anything yeah, well, you steve you uh, you started off with a question about uh, enterprise architecture and agility, and yeah, the, as I said, the two uh, coexist very strongly. Um, but when you think about, you know, how do you need to ad perhaps adapt some of the uh, enterprise architecture practices that we might have followed in in the past uh, in order to work in agile environments, then the cha a slight change well a change in your approach to governance is is one of the sort of very concrete things you see um you know typically in the in a waterfall style approach your main governance tools might be some sort of stage gate review you know you see these sorts of things happen very commonly as a project moves perhaps out of a requirements phase into a design phase and then at the end of design phase you you, you would probably organize large sort of formal stage gate reviews Whereas one of the very um, concrete changes you have to make moving to a, an agile style of delivery is to do a much more continuous and consultative approach to governance. And that, that has some challenges as well, uh, as, as well as the advantages of giving the, the greater agility. But that coupled with the obvious things like working, uh, developing the architecture in a much more iterative style. Um, it's those things I think are some of the real sort of concrete things that you have to change about your way of working so uh, chain uh, adapting your approach to governance is one of the things you need to do in order to to work and truly get the benefits of an agile approach okay. absolutely Hello. Steve, yeah steve my if you remember my session was on public digital platforms in yeah. november and in fact the from a government perspective uh, public digital platform is a great example of how agile architecture practices and microservice architecture that Chris and Peter have spoken about is actually getting implemented. So just to give you an example, uh, what we do is, uh, you know, for instance, we, we are currently having a platform for digital health. And within that, we have identified certain reusable building blocks, which is basically taking the solution building blocks you know, identified and mentioned in the TOGAF. So some of these reusable building blocks could be digital identity, registry, workflow management, content management, scheduling. So these are all common capabilities that are required across sectors. While I mentioned health, they could easily be used in education, for instance. They could easily be used in transportation. So taking a sectoral approach provides the ability to make this building blocks reusable across different platforms and platforms are open both to public and private sector entities and second is because they are reusable building blocks they don't have to so whenever there is a platform being developed they don't have to reinvent the wheel so 
by by definition it becomes agile because that's the whole idea right there are these whole building blocks that are being available in fact within the government enterprise architecture work group we are currently in the process of developing a reference architecture for public digital platforms it's called govstack so it's basically a, the technology stack for digital government govstack and we are going to adopt in fact we have within the team we have referred to the ideas of our agile architecture publications and even the microservices architecture paper that uh, peter was mentioning about so we are actually putting in place we you know putting in place in terms of how these concepts can be implemented and as you are aware and probably some of the people in the audience are also aware the intent here is that public digital platform should work for countries with limited resources mm -hmm. This is the only way to move forward. It is not an endless pit that you keep putting money on developing, you know, digital capabilities across ministries, across departments in a, you know, you know, replicating the same and, you know, wasting public resources. The whole idea is to bring standardization, at least in terms of certain common capabilities that can be used in a whole of government perspective. So this is what we are currently covering and we are referring to the work that Chris and Peter have mentioned. It's great. Nice to see it all, all, all coming together. Um, so, Palab, you, you, you mentioned the, um, the session you gave on the public digital platforms. Um, one of the questions that was was hanging over from that is um, in on those platforms, and you've kind of just touched on it as, as well in, uh, in your answer to the last question, but um, a two part question here. Do you create private clouds for government and you know, separate clouds essentially for government and commercial enterprise or um, are they shared? Um, and I think you've touched on that. But the, the, the second part of the question is, um, um, how do you manage the concerns of confidentiality and intellectual property from commercial enterprises who participate in public digital platforms? So generally, these are shared uh, infrastructures because the very idea that it is public, you know, by definition makes it a shared infrastructure, digital infrastructure, where both government entities and private entities can participate and, you know, come together and provide services in a way that is more usable for these citizens. So that is the whole idea of, uh, and basically it's basically API based integration, right? That MSA covers anyway. So. But in terms of confidentiality and, uh, you know, any, anything, any, anything concerning privacy, this is basically governed with, uh, you know, strong data rights, strong decision rights. Data is very important for public digital platforms because, uh, you know, it's basically the oil. I mean, it, it, I know it sounds like a cliche, but that's what runs the public digital platform. So there is a very strong element of data governance to make these platforms run number one and second is coming back to what peter was mentioning distributed governance so in the government you can actually see this multi-level government entities coming into play so there are national governments there are state or provincial governments there are local governments and maybe in some large countries there could even be some kind of a rural government and in large countries, they could belong to different political parties for reasons that we all know. They would probably not want to share data for various reasons. So therefore, we have to ensure that there are that certain data which is kept at the local level and only the uh, only it is only made accessible to a higher level of government, say from the local level to the state government to the federal government based on a need basis. So based on some kind of a consent. So that's how it works. So therefore, what happens is we are able to bring certain data at the national level. So for instance, if it is a digital ID, you know, social security number in the US, in India, it's called Aadhaar, right? It has to be a national ID. There is no need to have state level IDs because then it replicates the whole idea. You're the citizen of a country. So that's an example of a national data. So it's a national building block as I was mentioning. But there may be certain very department or ministry specific data which it's better left, you know, for instance, in health doc, in, 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 in health domain, data that is collected at the primary health center level, it's better left there, right? There is no need for them to provide all the data. It's only based on certain requirements and certain specific business processes that the national or the state level entity gets access to that data. So this is how we maintain a federated approach, basically to address the confidentiality and the privacy aspects that 
comes up when you talk of platforms. Excellent, excellent answer. Um, Chris or Peter, anything to add on uh, on uh, digital, uh, public digital platforms? Um, if not, then I'm going to, oh, you thought about it, Chris, didn't you? <clears throat> I thought about it, Steve, but also I'm, I'm aware of the clock. <laughs> conscious of the time, yes. Trying to be conscious of the time. We have got through the questions. There's one here that, that um, uh, if the panellists don't mind, I, I will take, because um, it's really a, a question for the open group, and that, and that is uh, something we get asked a lot. Uh, what enterprise architecture tools does the open group recommend? Um, and uh, the answer to that is that uh, we don't uh, recommend specific tools um, because we uh, very much have as one of our principles um, vendor and technology uh, neutrality. Um, what we do have is an official register of um, certified tools that, that um, the open group has um, comes up most commonly in connection with the Archimate modeling language. Um, what tools are out there for that? But also when implementing um, when implementing TOGAF, uh, there are some really great tools out there that we have um, uh, accredited over the years, which uh, I'll, I'll, if you're looking for a place to start, then look at the register that's on the open group website uh, for where you can find those tools. So um, with that, um, I'm going to uh, be respectful of everyone's time um, and uh, thank each of our, our panelists, um, uh, Chris Frost, Peter Maloney and Dr. Palab Saha for joining us again today. Uh, thank you for clearing up those, uh, those last questions. My pleasure. Great to hear your perspectives and um, yeah, thank you and um, see you all uh, some point in the future. Thank you. So we're not we're not done for this session, though, folks. Um, thank you to our panelists. Um, a couple of couple of plugs. Um, please join us again in two weeks, um, April the nineteenth, when we'll have episode seventeen. Can you believe of Toolkit Tuesday, um, where the main presenter that day will be my colleague Roberto Severo, um, who runs uh, our Brazilian office. And he'll be talking on the principles of an EA framework and the importance of adopting the TOGAF standard. So that's uh, April, April 19th. You'll see uh, a, a, a slide that mentions that in our outro video. And lastly, um, a reminder um, for the Open Group uh, Enterprise Architecture Practitioners event um, coming up at the end of this month. Do look at our website. Um, if you're on our email list, you'll, you'll see more about that. And uh, you'll see a few notifications coming out over the coming days and weeks uh, leading up to that, um, and some fun stuff that we're fun stuff that we're doing um, uh, in the build up to that conference. So watch out for our social media channels there, um, and uh, we'd love to see as many of you as as we can. And uh, meanwhile, you can uh, also participate through those social media channels, of course. So. Thank you for joining us today um, for Talk It Tuesday. That's it for this week. Wherever you are, be safe, be well, and see you next time. Bye for now.